Thank you, Mike. Thank you, everybody. A, uh, a democratic strategist once wisely said, everybody has a game plan until you punch them in the mouth. The left has obviously taken that strategy to heart and perfected it, while the right has taken so many shots to the mouth that we've been left punch drunk and on the ropes. But maybe not for much longer. Uh, David Horwitz's new book, Take No Prisoners, The Battle Plan for Defeating the, the Left, is the manual for conservative victory. It's the manual for punching the left in the mouth, which I think is an appropriate metaphor for an organization, the Freedom Center, which David himself has described as not a think tank, <clears throat> but a battle tank. This is the right book at the right time from the right man. Uh, I'm not going to uh, go on too long about David because there can't be anyone here who isn't aware of and deeply grateful for the epic contributions that David Horowitz has made for our side. He is the left's most notable apostate and most relentless nemesis. He is a lightning rod for their hatred and their politics of personal destruction, so the cost to him has been extraordinarily high. But his contributions have been and continue to be invaluable among those of us who uh, believe in the unfashionable values of freedom and American exceptionalism. In addition to his activism through the Freedom Center and his spearheading work to get college campuses fair and balanced, David has been such a prolific, important writer that I don't have time to list all of his books, but I will name just a few standouts, which you must read. Radical Son, Destructive Generation, Left Illusions, The Party of Defeat, The Art of Political War, Unholy Alliance, <clears throat> excuse me, The Black Book of the American Left, and Now Take No Prisoners, uh, including uh, the work that, that Mike mentioned that he's working on now. Such a slacker, David. Please try to, uh, could, you, could you get a little busier because uh, we need you. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome a man who has been very good to me personally, a man whose game plan will punch the left in the mouth, a one-man battle tank in defense of freedom, David Horowitz. <clears throat> Thank you, Mark. Uh, we have <clears throat> with us today two uh, celebrity friends. Uh, Stephen Bauer, who uh, you, it was a great actor. You may have. <laughs> you may remember him from Scarface, but any of you who are not watching Ray Donovan should start catching up where he plays Avi, uh, Donovan's security guy. And uh, the man whom I think is the funniest man in Hollywood, the uh, brains behind uh, the Naked Gun series, the Airplane series, uh, scary movies, David Zucker. C-SPAN is here, <clears throat> and I'd like to begin with a tribute to uh, Brian Lamb the Republican who has run this channel for 35 years and made it the fairest and most balanced cable network. I have a special reason to appreciate uh, this network and Brian's achievement. For 30 years, I have been blacklisted by the mainstream media for my political views. This, uh, as far as they're concerned, my books don't exist. The blacklist begins with the New York Times which sets the standard for all the other reviews. 30 years ago, the Times reviewed books that Peter uh, Collier and I wrote on the front page of its Sunday book review, calling them irresistible epics. But that's when Peter and I were leftists. In 1985, we wrote an article for the Washington Post called Lefties for Reagan, and the Times retali retaliated by relegating us to its back pages. As I became a more and more prominent conservative voice, the Times made me an unperson, and other papers followed suit. The last time the New York Review of Books reviewed a book of mine was in 1985, just before Peter and I had the bad judgment to reveal that we had voted for Reagan. So I take a particular pleasure in thanking Brian Lamb and the C-SPAN executives for keeping alive the fading American principles 
of tolerance and pluralism, which the Times and so-called liberals have traduced, and for giving me this opportunity to tell people about my book. Today is the 13th anniversary of the most devastating attack on the American homeland since the British burned the White House in 1812. The 9-11 atrocity was more than an attack. It was a declaration of war against America, against Israel, against the West generally, and against every modern value associated with tolerance and freedom. President Bush rose to this dark occasion as a worthy commander in chief, unlike the present occupant of the White House. Most importantly, he recognized the fact that this was a war declared on us. It was a war whose leader had said that it was the duty of every Muslim to kill every American, every Jew, every Christian, and every other infidel he could lay his hands on. Bush responded to this barbarian threat by declaring a war on terror, a war on the terrorists who had attacked us. Not just Al-Qaeda, but as he put it, on every terrorist force with a global reach. Unfortunately, the war on terror that Bush declared has been a war that Democrats have opposed for a decade and more. The precise moment they openly defected from the war on terror was July 2003, when the Democratic leadership turned against the war in Iraq, which they had authorized only months before. Since that time, Democrats have been so determined that the United States should not fight a war on terror that when a Democrat, Barack Obama, became president, he eliminated the term war on terror from, U from the U.S. government vocabulary entirely and replaced it with, quote, overseas contingency operations, which describes exactly nothing. Obama did worse, much worse. He set out to degrade America's military forces and appease America's Islamist enemies bowing and scraping before Islamists who were sworn to kill Americans uh, when, when they could. Obama supported and financed the Muslim Brotherhood, which is the fountainhead of Islamic terror. To this evil organization, then in control of Egypt's government, he gave 1.4 billion American dollars and 16 fighter bombers, which would have been used against Israel had not the Brotherhood been overthrown shortly afterwards and outlawed. For over a decade, Democrats have insisted that the war conducted by Islamic terrorists against Americans be treated as individual criminal acts to be prosecuted in civilian courts of law where the terrorists will be protected by hard-won rights of Americans. These will be used by the terrorists to tie our hands, allowing them to squander millions of taxpayer dollars pretending to be innocent. The war we are in is a war between barbarism and civilization, and Democrats have done everything they could to sabotage our side of the war and disarm us in the face of this terror. When I hear a Republican say something like this, I will begin to believe that Republicans might win the 2016 elections. Since 1945, Republicans have never won a national, the popular vote in a national election where national security was not a, or the primary issue of the campaign. Yet in 2008 and 2012, national security was almost absent from the Republican campaign plan. They were afraid to mention Obama's assault on the nation's security because the Democrats would attack them as warmongers. In the third debate on foreign policy, Romney actually hugged the leader of America's global retreat and pretended to endorse his policies. How did this happen? It happened because Republicans gave up the national security narrative when they failed to defend America's intervention in Iraq and worse, failed to hold Democrats responsible for betraying the war, which was vital to the war on terror. Bush was right to go into Iraq in March 2003. Applause 
It was right to remove Saddam Hussein, one of the monsters of the 20th century.